friends, good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. Good morning. Good morning, Gil. If you've ever watched the movie, What About Bob? Bob is, has a goldfish, and he speaks to it every morning. And he always does this, of course, a goldfish doesn't talk back to him. So he says, good morning, Gil. And the goldfish, and he says, good morning. I wonder how many goldfish we have out there this morning. The great news is that we are launching again our church, right? We're coming back together after a six-month hiatus, and so we're glad that you're here this morning. We're glad to celebrate, not only here, but everybody that is online watching us uh, through new technology. You know, we've, over the past six months, we've had people that have been connecting with us on a consistent basis from friends that we had made when we were in Israel, from Palestine, um, have tuned in from time to time. Uh, our friends that we have in Haiti will log in and, and check us out and, and comment on things. So the point is, is that, you know, the, the impact that you have um, is not just here in Mineral Wells within a five-mile radius. I mean, think about the distance to Palestine or to Haiti or to Seattle. Um, Alex is out in Seattle somewhere. As we gather this morning, we're glad that you're with us. Um, if you have... I hope that this week you were able to see either receive an email from the church and or log on Facebook so that you could register um, and, and that would get that would allow us to to know that who's showing up it just allows us to, to predict uh, what we need to plan for and prepare for so if you have not gotten that email Again, for our friends that are watching this online, if you have not received that email, please let us know. Please send us, call us, let us know so that we can include you, um, so that we can do some things that are, um, allow you to be more involved in what is unfolding in the next weeks and months. As, as this virus has overtaken us, we've all been challenged in ways that we never imagined possible. There will be some people that will respond to that challenge by entering into a siege mentality, right? God is against us. I think God sometimes brings challenges and storms into our lives to see what's really inside of us, right? Do we have the tenacity and do we have the perseverance? That's what's being refined right now. That's what's kind of going through. So this morning as we gather for worship, we recognize that the church is not giving up. Yeah, uh, we've had some real storms in our lives. All of you are facing things. Your community are, is facing things. But we have not given up. Um, and I think that that's the power of our faith. Right? God is doing something. God is doing a new thing. And he's letting you and me in on it. We, we're allowed to be a part of it. We're not spectators. You're not here this morning to be a spectator. You're not here to, to see a show. You're here to realign your life and say, God, use me. By being here, by being virtue of showing up, you're saying, God, use me, right? If you want to see a show, I think the Regal Theater is still open. I, I can't be sure of that. Um, you can do that. But by virtue of being a part of worship this morning, you are saying, God, I am willing to push back the dark. I'm going to light my little candle and ask you to send me into the dark. Now, for all of you, you know that the darkness has no power over the light. It has nothing. So what are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? We gather this morning to remember and to light our candles, to re-energize with the oil, and to remember that God has something amazing, right? We don't go through storms like this for nothing. God doesn't waste a crisis, right? So I'm glad that you're here this morning. And I, I hope that the singers have come to share their gifts and their talents. They have come to inspire you, but also to motivate you to jump into the flow of what God is doing. So we're excited about what, what God has in store for us. So I want to hear from you. I know that you've got masks on, and, and I hope that I can hear from you. But what are some of your prayer concerns this morning? 
As we gather, what are some of the things that, that are on your heart? We have a number of people that are on our prayer list this morning. We want to continue to pray for Ural Hunt. Uh, Ural is, is doing okay, but uh, needs our prayers. For Bud uh, Moore, as well as for Thornton Smith. Um, they, are, they need our prayers this morning. Are there special prayers in your life that you would like to pray for? For Nathan? For Nathan, for Nathan Somerville? Yes. For the schools, for teachers, and for parents. Yeah, yeah. Challenging times, right? Challenging times. Yes. Well, that, that's your way of announcing. <laughs> Christina and Blake are expecting, as Greg and Elaine are expecting their first grandchild. Next March, March. Congratulations. Deneen Moore um, had surgery on her hand and, and will be in a cast for about a week. Um, for, I guess I can say this over, over Facebook, um, today is Lynette's birthday and she decided to spend it in Cleveland. So I don't have to take her out today, but I will tomorrow, I think. As we gather today, remember all that are gathered here. Um, as we prepare our hearts for worship, we recognize that God is drawing us into a life of prayer. It, prayer is not just something that you bow your head, you say a, a, a few mystical words, and you, maybe you can get God to do what it is that you want to do. That's something else. That's, an in, that's called an incantation. Prayer is harmony. Prayer is, is listening more than it is speaking. So as we gather today, we allow God to wash over us, to heal us and to speak to us. Would you join with me now in our call to worship? Oh God, we come into your courts with praise and thanksgiving. Celebrate. We come in gratitude for all you have bestowed upon us. We have heard the cry of the poor, the lonely, and the tired. O oh God, we come into your courts with praise and thanksgiving, for God is good and all the time. Let us pray. Gracious God, your people are hurting. Where there is woundedness, help us bring healing. Where there is discouragement, help us bring support and comfort. Where there is loneliness and grief, help us bring the power of new life and new opportunities. Heal us, O oh God, for you are our shepherd, our ever-present help, and our eternal hope. You are the one that we turn to in times of trouble, and you are the lover of our souls. Come, Holy Spirit, and cast away our doubts and fears, that we may be bold in our witness and guide us with your gentle hand, that we may joyfully serve Christ whenever and wherever you call to us. Hear our prayers for those that we have named before you who are on our hearts. Help us to serve them and all of your children everywhere who cry out to you and long to be comforted. This we pray in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now if the singers would come and join us in our first song, Victory in Jesus. Family, you may stand with us as we go into a time of worship. gets shared before we go into the next song we weren't sure okay <laughs> we are happy to continue in song and hope that you are free just feel free to worship whatever that means for you this song has hand motions if you know it please join along
we'll get to a point where the kids can come join us. That'll be fun. fun. We got another one that's a lot of fun for Kim and I to sing for you, and we hope that you enjoy it this morning.
God, we give you praise. We thank you that in your great name and by the power of your Holy Spirit, there truly is nothing that you will not do to come reach out and find us. There's nothing you won't hesitate to reach through, shadows to light up, darkness will flee in your name and your Holy Spirit. Thank you that you love us that much and help us to seek you with a pure heart because of that love. Streams of 
seated. I want to say a special thanks to uh, all of the musicians for, for Kimberly, uh, for Michael, Justin, and David for, for offering that gift. Uh, getting ready for this morning was a little stressful, um, making sure everything was in place. Um, I'm sure that the the three cups of coffee that I had before coming in probably didn't help. But now, because of their gift, uh, I, I, I feel like God is here. And, and is, you know, the, we all come with questions about uh, what today holds. Like, you know, I, I, remember, I remember when we first had uh, our daughter, uh, Caitlin, and we were struggling to figure, you know, as, as new parents, you're trying to figure out all this, this crazy stuff you know, with diapers and all that kind of stuff. And I remember going back to my mom and said, mom, I mean, mom, you cannot imagine what it's like. And she said, Are you, you know, she kind of set me straight. And, and the point is, is that sometimes we think nobody has ever experienced stress like this, uncertainty like this. And yet we find it throughout scripture. We find it through history. And, and we learn that God is doing a new thing. Right? Every time that we get stressed or we're anxious, it's because we're being stretched. We're being invited into a deeper place. Well, this morning, our scripture, we go back to scripture because the Bible tells us that God's word is a light for our path. It guides us. Um, and, and so we, we talk about what that, that all means. Um, actually, if, if you don't mind, because I screwed this up, if you don't mind showing the children's video, We'll go to, to children's time. I remember it being louder than this. Okay, so we just, just move on. It was really good. I, I just want to let you know. I was saying mine, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't do mines very well. Okay. This is the, this is the, the wonderful thing about doing, doing worship live, right? Go back to videos and we can fix that, but... God's word speaks to us in a variety of ways. And so as we encounter God's word in 1 Timothy, Paul is writing to his protege, Timothy. Timothy is starting a church. Um, you might even think of it as a new church launch. And so the master is writing to Timothy um, about, you know, what should he talk to his people about? And so I thought this morning as we think about our own faith journey, um, about launching a church. What, is, what does Paul want to talk to us about this morning? And so from 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, listen to it uh, for where you are and the challenges that you are facing. Paul writes, he says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people for kings and for those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in godliness and holiness. This is, this is good and pleases God our Savior. Amen to that. 
who wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. And this, is, this has now been witnessed to at least at the proper time. And for this purpose, I was appointed as a herald and as an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. And the truth, and a truth and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. This is the word of God for the people of God. So Paul is saying, right, that we as a people need to be in, in a constant prayer of inviting people into that knowledge, right? the knowledge that we have of what God is doing. Well, friends, through time of uncertainty and chaos, people have always responded by sharing the historic affirmation of our faith, the Apostles' Creed. If you would, if you're able to stand where you are as we share in this historic affirmation. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Now, normally during this time, uh, we would take up an offering. And oftentimes, people have confused what offering is. And, and, and I mean that sincerely, because a lot of times, and, and it happens in a very subtle way, oftentimes people feel that offering is... <laughs> Uh, pay-per-view, that somehow, because you showed up this morning, you should pay for the privilege of being in your pew and enjoying a little of the electricity and the air conditioning, right? Now, the point here is then what happens is if next Sunday, because of illness or some other catastrophe, you're not able to be here, well, then you don't need to participate because you didn't use any of the services. That's what I mean by a pay-per-view. But that's, not, that's never been the purpose of offering. Offering is as vital, if, if not more so, to our songs and our prayer because it's us giving of ourselves to God. It's saying, God, everything that I have, all that is valuable to me, my, my time, my money and my talent, they, they came from you and they will return to you. And so now today, we are not able to take up offering. We're not able to pass the plates as we normally would. And, and we're not able to come and say, God, these are our gifts. This is who we are. This is how much we value our relationship to you. And this is how inspired we are to be a part of a church that is reaching out to its community. We, we're not able to do that, but that does not mean that God does not know your heart. And so we have over here, we have the offering plates. And so at the end of the service, as you exit uh, the sanctuary, please feel free to drop your tithe and your offerings, right? Now, what's the difference? Does anybody know the difference between the tithes and the offerings? Tithe is your 10%. That is, that is the standard for members, right? If, you're visiting with us, if you were visiting with us today uh, across the spectrum online, you could make an offering, right, uh, to God for, the, for, for worship of being, being grateful. But if you're a member, if, you're, if you've made the commitment to say, hey, um, I'm on the team, right, you, you can count on me. You can count on me then the tithe is what you've committed to. Right? This coming weekend, I, I'm, I'm kind of, the advantage of having people is, is I tend to ramble. Have you noticed? <laughs> this coming weekend, next weekend, um, we're going to do, I have a wedding to do um, at, at uh, uh, Allie Cooper's getting married. Um, 
she came and sat right over here. Anyway, um, so I've been talking to them about the seriousness of vows. Do, do, you know, vows are serious things. Like when you got married, right, you, you, you came before everybody and you made a vow till death do you part, right? How many of you made a vow to God that maybe you don't hold as sincerely, right? This is where we say this is, this is what it means to me. This is the value to me. But it comes from a heart of gratitude. It comes from people that are just filled with gratitude. Look, Lord, we're able to be here. We, we have our health. We have a community. We have this, these facilities. And we have a mission that is bigger than any of us. Boy, that should make you grateful for what God is doing. So, friends, I invite you to give your tithes and your offerings out of a heart of gratitude because it'll change the way you see life. Let us pray for all the gifts that we have received. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for every good gift comes from above. But you know, Father, sometimes we get so consumed by our schedules and by the things that we don't have that we fail to recognize the things that we do have, the hope that we have, the promise that we have, the strength of your spirit surging within us. And we thank you, Father, that we can come as friends and neighbors to celebrate life together. Father, as we offer these gifts, we pray that they help fuel the fire that is within us and burns ever so brightly in our world to dispel the darkness. So bless these gifts and the hearts that have given that they may know your joy and your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. Are you guys going to sing anymore? Yes, okay. Before I do my thing? Oh, okay, okay, all right. This is live. I want to tell you how many of you. Um, everybody's got got a mask. Um, I, I don't. I had one cloth mask, you know, the one that kind of comes like you, kind of goes over your nose. Um, and I wore it to a soccer game, you know, and I was feeling really good because it had a little symbol on it. it felt really soccer like um, uh, until I went out and they said, you know, you have your mask on upside down. <laughs> and so it was kind of all of that. Um, confidence and respect kind of went right out the window uh, when I did that. So think about it for a moment. Um, this is the first Sunday we're back together. What, what should we talk about? Um, where do we go? What, would, what's, what do you think's on people's hearts as we're coming back together? And I want you to think about that. I want to think about the stress, the uncertainty, the fear, and the anxiety. And I want you to think about all of that that's facing our world today. You know, we started with this process called um, the summit. It's about discipleship. Right? And, and, and the reason for that is when you think about what we do here as a church, right? Every so often as a church, as a community, there's a time of refining time of cleansing, right? What is it that we do? Some people come for different reasons. And I talked about that. I said, you know, when, when you take up an offering, some people, th this is actually, uh, okay, I'm, I'm not used to having people in front of me, so uh, bear with me. This is why, actually, uh, we take up an, in, when we had a full house, we would take up an offering before the message and not after, because people would do the pay-per-view, right, idea. They say, oh, that was like a $5 sermon, right? So whenever you would look, you, you, people that would put the offering after the sermon, people would respond by how well they enjoyed it. Did that touch me? Did I get something out of it? Well, then I give a certain amount. And, and that's the wrong mentality, but that would happen, right? 
Uh, so that's why we do it the way we do it. But the, the point here is, what is the focus? What is the mission of the church? Because, right, without a clear definition of what it is that we do as a church body, we can easily go off course. We can easily become a concert hall, right? Come and hear great music. That's what I'm here for. I want to I be entertained, right? Or maybe it becomes a movie theater, Right? I love a stage performance. It becomes a, a the, I like, I, I want to be entertained. And, and we've all had those moments where we left and said, you know, I really didn't get much out of the service today. You know, pastors hear that a lot. But the question is, is what if God were here today? What would he say to you? Wow, I'm looking at your life. I didn't get a lot out of this person today, right? Would he ever say that? So the summit is really about discipleship. The core value, the core mission of the church is to raise disciples, to take them from infants, from the immature, and through study, through learning, through practice, to raise you up to full maturity so that, Paul says, so that we can be presented fully mature in Christ. Okay, so... That's our core value. That's, that's essential to our existence. That's why we exist, to make disciples for Jesus. That's, that's why we exist. Okay. Oop. There we are. Ah. So now we find ourselves in a crisis. Six months, no showing up. Just close the doors. We're done. That's it. Now, the advantage is, is this morning, as, as we're talking, I can look at you. I can see you. We, we, ha- we make eye contact. And I can tell whether you're, you're asleep, for most of you, or not. But then we, we close our doors. I can't, I don't know. You don't have to attend. I, I can't tell. Nobody knows. What will we do then? A crisis comes and says, will you stand or will you fall? Right? Jesus, you remember that parable Jesus told about a house being built on sand or built on rock? When a crisis comes, will you be able to stand or fall? And that's really what crises do. They refine, they purify, they cleanse. We are in a time of cleansing. Right? So there's a couple of questions that I want to ask you, just give you some things to think about, about in your own life. The first one is is when we think about the church, we want to ask, what is the purpose of the church? What is the purpose for you, right? What is the purpose for you? Is it, it, uh, you know, you get your own special pew? The purpose of church is is good entertainment. What, What is the value of church for you? That's what this is defining because it's been radically altered. And now you have to decide what does it mean for you? The second thing is, is what is my purpose in church? These are big questions. Am I a consumer or am I a contributor? Do I consume spiritual religiosity? Do I come here just to feel good about myself? Right? I had a, um, in my, my previous appointment, I had a man come in and he said, Steve, you don't, you don't understand us at all. He said, We're just here to feel good about ourselves. We come in, we want to get our religious fix, and we want to go home for the week. That's it. Everything you're talking about, discipleship, doesn't mean anything to us, right? What he was saying is this is a social habit. We we get together to see and to be seen. We feel good. We want to get, I'm good, you're okay, right? The question that you have to wrestle with in this pandemic is, what is your purpose in the church? Do you have one? Maybe you don't have one. Maybe you you have decided to be a consumer. And of course, if if that's your if if that if if you find a big question mark after that one, like going, I don't know, then the big question is, is what is my relationship to Jesus? Right? Because what is the church? Jesus said, the this is the church is often called what? The body of Christ. So if I don't know what my relationship is with the body of Christ, or if I don't have one, what is my relationship with Jesus? 
So we decided we got to drill down on this. For those that are willing to do it, right? Not everybody is, right? Jesus said, I'm going to call my sheep. Some will hear me and some will recognize the voice and some will not. He said it. I didn't. He said, I'm going to call my sheep. Not everybody will hear it and not everybody will come because they are not of my flock. So basically, we started with this idea of discipleship. Discipleship is intentionally learning to imitate Jesus. That's what discipleship is. We follow Jesus in order to imitate Jesus. You have decided by virtue of being here, by being a Christian, by being part of this church, that you said, I want to be trained and I want to practice how to be like Jesus in every circumstance. Okay, that, that's, what we're, that's what we're asking. That's what discipleship means. Now, when we talk about discipleship, because most of the time when people talk about discipleship, they mean just, well, doesn't it mean just showing up? It just means going through the motions, right? Well, basically, we're talking about an adventure. That's what I've been trying to do with the whole summit so that you get some inspiration, you get some motivation that you feel that God is doing exciting things in your life, right? Because discipleship is not a boring component of your life that you say, look, I, you know, discipleship or being a Christian means showing up Sunday morning. That's going to get boring really fast. If that's all the deeper that you go, if Sunday morning is all the deeper that you go, you're going to get bored really fast, right? This isn't, This isn't all that there is. This is the problem. Most people, if you've ever been to the ocean, and I've used this analogy before, if you've ever been to the ocean, it's it's a calming because it's very rhythmical, right? You know, the waves are crashing. But if you just stand there for a while just watching the waves, I would imagine after about an hour or so, it gets kind of monotonous. And you say, is this all that there is? It's like there's so much more that you're not aware of. Adventure is an unusual, exciting, and, you know, even a hazardous adventure. I love the way Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he was a pastor during during the Second World War and went back to Germany to confront the Nazi occupation. But he recognized that discipleship was so decisive and so challenging, and he recognized that Christians had lost that energy and that enthusiasm. Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said, and get this, he said, he said, salvation is free. He said, but discipleship will cost your life. Right? Now think about that. Do you own, it's like two sides of the same coin, but do you own that coin? Most people say, I love the salvation is free part. I'll buy that. But count me out for the costly part. And what Bonhoeffer is saying is you can't have one without the other. You can't have one without the other. So I want you to ask in the back of your mind, right? I'm not going to ask for raised hands. Are you saved? Are you saved? Maybe. I don't know. You know the answer to that already. John Eldridge, and I've used this before, adventure with all of its requisite dangers and wildness is deeply spiritual longing written into the soul of man. We are hungering and thirsting for some great adventure to sink our teeth into. More than just nine to five job, more than just showing up, more than just going through the motions. We want to know that all of the challenges that you're facing, all the uncertainty that lies ahead is part of a great adventure, a great story that is yours and yours alone. And so we began to talk about the summit. We talked about going through different phases. Some people get stuck. But there's a progression. There's a, there's a way to move forward. It's, it's one thing to say, go and do good things, right? Because most people say, how? What, what do I need to do? And so we talked about the different phases. And, and this is available to you if you want to download it. It's on the church's website under resources. 
because my mission, or at least where my heart is for you, you know, I look at, at, at you sitting out there and I said, these people are hungering for more in their life, right? They feel deep down inside that, that despite all of the turmoil, all of the uncertainty, they were made for more than just what their job title is. They were made for more than just what they have in the bank account or how big their house is or how their car compares. They believe that you believe that there's some spark within you that is just wanting to be flamed, to be fanned into a full flame. You see, Christianity at its best when it is asking us hard questions of ourselves, when it helps us to do what is right, not just what is easy, and then it inspires us to become more than we ever imagined possible. You are already on a journey. You are already on a pathway. The challenge is, is most people don't think about it. They let somebody else determine the nature of that pathway. And so that's what we've been really trying to do, trying to give you a map for where you are and where you're going. Without a map, every road will look promising. And sometimes it's the one with the loudest voice. It's those that are the most urgent, the most pressing. And so we have become short-term thinkers. What is the most important thing I have to do now? And we don't think about the long term. But when you have a map, the right road becomes obvious, right? Psalm 119. Thy word, God's word, over the ages, over the generations, is a lamp unto my feet. It will guide me. Proverbs chapter 3. Acknowledge him, seek him in all of your ways, and he will make your path straight. So where do we begin? At the beginning. So we started this journey, and I wanted to just summarize, if I could, before we kind of jump in full bore. First of all, we started with those people in, in our culture that are just chasing carrots. It is the endless pursuit of a moving target. There's always more. There's always something bigger. There's always some carrot out there luring you to the next promotion, the higher salary, the bigger car, the next vacation. What's coming next for you? What's drawing you and keeping you busy? Right? These are the people that are chasing carrots. They, they have no time for spirituality, no time for the long term. They're so focused on the here and now. And we said that busyness is artificial significance. No, this has never been more of a struggle than in our generation when we have social media that people are checking all the time. Do you have those things with your phone where now it will tell you how many hours you've spent on your phone? How many times you've, ch you can do this. Your phone will tell you how many hours you've been on your phone, how many times you've checked this Facebook or whatever it is, right? Because we are so focused on what people are saying in the moment, in the second, how many likes you have and how many friends you have. And we're so focused in the short term, we fail to see the big picture that's going on around you. We often talk about it, you, you see the, the trees, but not the forest. These are the people that are so busy, so burnt out, so exhausted, chasing the next thing, hoping that the next thing would please them. So if you're God, I want you to play God for a moment. And your children are running after everything. They're just, they're in a hundred different activities in different sports and they're, they're just tired. They get no rest and they, they know that there's expectations from their friends about how they look and how they feel and what they're wearing and the pressures of school. And you have them in all kinds of sports and in all kinds of music and all, dance and whatever it is. And you're kind of going, you got to cut some stuff out. I love you too much to say it's about what you do. I just want to spend some time with you. One of the things that people have been noticing during this pandemic, right, is now families are starting to sit down together at the table. I know they're getting, right? They're actually going, they're actually finding out they like each other, which is kind of a weird thing, right? But if you're too burnt out and God said, I love my children too much to let them burn themselves out on meaningless things. Well, there are those people that we call the tourists. These are people that are 
they're fearful of missing out. So they, they jump from one thing to another. They look for what everybody else is doing so that I can do it too. We often call this spiritual ADD, right? They're connected. To, they may even connect to the church on Christmas and Easter or for special occasions, but they're way too busy to get involved with that kind of stuff. Or, or they jump from one thing to another, always looking for something better to do. What's the next big thing? What's the next musical uh, trend or genre that is coming out? Always looking, never really going very deep. It's kind of people that go to, the, to look at all the shops at the base of the mountain, right? That's what I'm looking at, what's for sale, what's hot, what's trending, but never really look at the mountain itself, never really engage in the mountain itself. Carl Jung, the Swiss psychologist, once said that people will do anything, no matter how absurd, to, to avoid facing their own souls. And so what we do as a church is we invite you to, to go deeper, that, that spark that is already there. Who are you deep down inside? And so, of course, the last one, the next one is, is a huge leap because tourists don't really connect with us very well, but there's something about people that, that God is calling they, they feel something. There, there's an unease. It's almost like I, I'm, I'm here, but I don't, feel, I don't feel at home here, right? I feel homesick. And, and we talked about this, homesick for a place that you've never been to before. I feel like God wants more out of me, that, that when I look at, at a fall with all the colored leaves, I feel connected to something more. These are the Christians that said, I'm part of the mountain. I've begun the journey. I'm, I'm, I'm moving towards something. Maybe I can't really define it very well. I don't really understand it, but there's something that wants more out of my life than just showing up and going through the motions. And we call those people Christians. They join the church. They become part of this movement, but something will happen to them. And this is this is what happens, I think, to a vast majority of Christians. And this is the point of, that I wanted to get to this morning. Believe it or not, that was all preamble. Most end up like this, right, as a couch. But what, what I mean by, what's a couch potato? They just kind of sit there and they just absorb. One time they had a passion. They wanted to know Jesus at a deeper level. One time they wanted to challenge themselves. They wanted to go deeper. They wanted to struggle, and they wanted to do something for a great and noble purpose, but eventually, over time, they just kind of acquiesced to what was happening around them, and they stopped. So we come now to, to a time of great pandemic, and there's another stage after, after those that are homesick. They begin, but for all of us, and I've never known anybody not go through this stage they, everybody does. Some point in your life, you will hit the wall. At some point in your spiritual journey, you will hit the wall. Think about this for a moment. Athletes do it. You've done it. Maybe you, you had great ambition to, to learn an instrument or to do something new, and, and you started with great guns and great, you're, you're going to run a marathon, and you get started. And maybe the first quarter mile is okay. But as you keep going, it gets harder and harder. And, and for the great athletes and great politicians too, for great athletes, there comes a point whether they're going to push through that pain, that hardship, and they're going to come to a different level of understanding. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about going beyond the limits of your faith. Beyond what I mean by that is just like going through the motions. There's a point at which you understand, but going to a deeper level. We've often talked about faith that has not been tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. There comes a point in all of us where the question is going to be asked of you, are you going the distance? Will you be there? when the going gets tough? Will you go to the higher level? It's one thing to go when you're energized, right? You're, you're a new Christian, you're just going, this is great, right? I have a new faith, a new purpose, a new mission in life. And then as the time goes on and the years go on, 
becomes harder and that energy has to give way to something new. Going back to, to our premarital counseling. When you talk to young people, they, right, they come in for marriage and, and they're just so excited, just so elated. We're gonna get married and life will be good. And it's like, that's true. But understand, those butterflies that you once had in the pit of your stomach, they have got to mature to a deeper level. It, it, isn't, it, it isn't that they go away, they mature to a deeper understanding. If all that you understand are that butterfly moments, you'll never go to a deeper level of what a relationship can be. So why do people want to go no farther? Why, why do most Christians kind of get to one place and stop? People will say, I will go this far and no further because it's too risky. It's too risky, right? What, 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 if they ask me to, what if they ask me to pray? Can you imagine the humiliation? What if they ask me to serve somewhere, right? Maybe it's too challenging. What if I have to read something? What if I have to expand what my understanding is of the world in which I live? And so a lot of people become those couch potatoes. A lot of Christians become couch potatoes. And maybe we as a church have a problem because we don't call people out and say, you know, I've noticed that you've been sitting here for the last couple of years. Tell me about the Bible study that you're a part of, how it's expanding your horizons and your, le your ideas. Henry Blackaby wrote a book several years ago about how to experience God. And it's a wonderful study. It's a wonderful book. And he said, here's what happens. He said, everybody comes to a place where they experience God. They, they see God at work. They know that God is working in this place. They see lives being transformed. They, they see people being elevated and they see people being energized. And then it comes a crisis of belief. Will you join them or will you just watch from the sidelines? And he said, that's the, that's the defining moment of a crisis of belief. Now, this morning, believe it or not, I wanted to share uh, some scripture with you where Jesus did exactly that. He gave people a crisis of belief. Will you go the distance? And I wanted to present it to you because I want you to ruminate on this. I want you to chew on it. I want you to think about it over the week. He's talking in Matthew's gospel. Um, unfortunately, I didn't put it on the screen. On the, I hope you can read that. He starts by talking from Matthew chapter 5. He said, first of all, he said, you have heard it said that an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you that you must not oppose those who want to hurt you. If people slap you on the right cheek, you must turn the left to them as well. And when they want to haul you into court and take your shirt, let them have your coat as well. And when you are forced to go one mile with them, go two. Give to those who ask and don't refuse those who wish to borrow from you. So Jesus is saying, you're, you're all very comfortable, right, with the law of retaliation, right? An eye for an eye. You do it to me, I do it to you. If I'm not getting anything from you, then I'm, you're, I'm done with you. That's the law of retaliation. He said, not so with you. Not so with you. He talks about the law of love. Now, we, we often use that word, too, I think too flippantly. What I mean is, is we say, you know, love one another, give them a big hug and hope, wish them well. He doesn't do that. He said, now you have heard it said, which is the counter to the, the previous one. He said, you have heard it said, but you must love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's the wall. That's the wall. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who harass you so that you will be acting as children of your father who is in heaven. For he makes the sun to rise on both the evil and the good and sends rain on both the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love only those who love you, what, re what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same. And if, if you greet only those brothers and sisters, 
What more are you doing? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, just as your heavenly Father is complete in showing love to everyone, so you must be complete. Actually, the NIV says, as your heavenly Father is perfect, you should be perfect. Do you see the wall that he's talking about? We're comfortable up to a point, and he said, but will you break through that wall and go to a deeper place? Right? So this is the challenge, right? Yeah, we already did that one. What are your limits? What is your wall? What defines this is all the farther I will go and no farther? Is it your time? I only have a limited amount of time. Can't be a part of this. Is it your money? Is it more protective? Is it, does it have its roots too deep in you? Or is it pain? And by that can be a number of things. It can be emotional pain. It can be uh, I'm afraid of taking the risk of people seeing me differently, right? I, I don't want to get involved at that level because what if I look silly? That can be your limit. I love this quote by A.W. Tozer. He said, God will never use anyone greatly until he tests them deeply. You have a limited understanding of church and faith because you've limited what God can do. There's, you have hit the wall every time. So imagine that you, want, you, you, want, you have in your mind that you want to run a marathon and you want to feel the exhilaration of, of, a, of a milestone in your life but you can never get past that quarter mile. Every time you hit that wall, your muscles start to get sore. You say, I'm done. There's just too much pain. You never get there. God always takes his saints to a deep place because he tests them in ways. Now, I believe right now we are being tested. As a, as a church, as, as a community, we're being tested. So I want to share a couple of things, if I can, and then I promise to wrap it up. This is what we're calling the, the trekker phase. It, it means trusting God when you are scared to death. Trusting God when you're scared to death, not just about your future, but about doing something you've never done before, about using your talents in ways you never imagined possible. You see, here's the thing. Most people want this. This is what they think of when they think of church, right? Man, we're all on the mountaintop. God's going to take us to the mountaintop, and we're all going to praise God. But you can't get there until you go through this. This is actually, by the way, um, a couple of years ago, we had an opportunity to, to climb the mountains in, in Colorado. And there is, at the lower levels, it's, it's, it's pine, and it's hemlock, and it's soft under your feet, and the dirt just kind of goes. But then you get to a level where all of those trees fade away, and for the next two hours, this is all you've got. And it goes on, and it's barren, and it's hard, and it's uphill. But if you want to get to the top, you have got to go through. Most people do not understand the serenity of being truly in God's presence until they've gone through this kind of pain. Okay? So, here's a couple of things I want you to think about when you hit, the, hit that wall. Your faith should scare you a little and energize you a lot. What, what right now is scaring you about your faith? Where is God? Because if they're saying, there's nothing that scares me, that's because you're either at a tourist level or you've just kind of like, God, no farther, right? If God starts causing me pain or risk or challenge, then you're done. Well, pretty soon, God's going to say, I'm not going to knock anymore, right? Because you, you've, you've locked the door. What is scaring you about your faith? What risks are you taking? Do you see life filled with problems or potential? If you're able to replace, why is this happening to me? With what is God trying to teach me? What lessons can I learn about my behavior or about the things that I'm going through? It will unlock something inside of you. No longer are you fearful of the future. You're saying God is going to do a new thing. Leo Trotsky once said, 
Life is not an easy matter. You cannot live through it without falling into frustration and cynicism unless you have before you a great idea which raises you above personal misery, above weakness, above all kinds of deceit and baseness. Until you have that vision and you can push through the barriers that will inevitably come, you will not reach the summit. Now, I understand this is probably pretty deep stuff. And I get it that sometimes people say, look, just tell me I'm okay and you're okay. But I think that you're here this morning because we have reached a wall. And what we're trying to define is whether this church or any church for that matter will push through to the other side. What did it really mean to you after all? So let me ask you a couple of questions, and then I'll, I promise I'll, I'll shut up. Where are you currently taking risks? Where are you currently taking risks? Where are you currently being challenged the most? Right? Now, they kind of go hand in hand. If you're, if you're taking risks, you're probably being challenged. Here's the thing. A lot of times people kind of, you know, what do I have to do to get into heaven? You don't really have to worry about getting into heaven. You've already made that choice. Now you have to understand it. Right? Now you have to understand why you made that choice. I'm not taking any risks. I have no intention of taking any risks. Yeah, well, then don't worry about heaven. That's okay, but you're making those choices. Where are you currently going the extra mile? Where are you currently going? Because when you have a passion, you don't have to tell people, hey, would you help out? They, count me in. I'm in. You just, have to, you just have to give me a direction, and I'm gone. I want to reach the summit. I want to see the perspective from the top. That's what my life is about. You don't have to tell me hey, you know, give somebody a, a kick in the pants. They're already moving. The problem is, is people have stopped believing that there's more. What about discipleship scares you the most? What about discipleship scares you the most? Here's the scary part about grace. If you believe in amazing grace, if you believe in grace, it should scare you a lot. It really should. Because if you believe and you accept God's grace, then there is nothing God cannot ask of you. There is nothing He can't ask of you. So when we get up and we sing, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, it saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm fine. was blind, but now I'm see. And God say, this is what I need from you. And you say, no, I don't think so. Then you don't know the power of grace yet. You really have not accepted it. What scares you the most about discipleship? Because basically, the alternative to, dis to discipline and discipleship is disaster. That's the ultimate, okay? Well, friends, next time we're going to be talking about the next phase. What does it mean? What does it look like to reach the top? You know, because until you've heard from people that have been there, until you understand the, what it looks like from the top, you'll be settled with the bottom. And so we're going to think about going the distance. Right? To break through that wall, whatever has been holding you back to, to a low level of understanding of who God is, to a different level where everything is rich and wonderful. Everything that you are going through now is informing your life in some new and powerful way. You're not just going through the motions, you're experiencing a new life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for this day. This is a new day. This is a new blessing. This is a new beginning for all of us. And we pray, Father, that the challenges that we face will continue to inspire us to new life. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. What are we doing now?
What? Are f- what? We're going to sing. What? What a friend we have in Jesus. Now, in the past, right, we'd say take somebody that's standing next to you. But for many of you, there's nobody standing next to you. And we're not able to grab each other's hand. But we are able to be the church together. So receive this blessing as you go. May the love of God the Father, the grace of God the Son, and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit rest upon you and give you peace. Go and experience the fullness of God's grace. In Jesus' name, amen. And as you exit, you can just make your way out this way.